Welcome to today's webinar, Litigation 101, How the Court System Can Impact Commercial Tobacco Control Policy. My name is Tom Pryor. I'm a new staff attorney here at the Public Health Law Center. I joined the Public Health Law Center from private practice where I did business litigation. Uh, and before that, I was in graduate school getting a PhD in political science where I studied American politics and the courts. So um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about these issues and really appreciate your time um, joining us to, to cover these really important um, topics and ideas. A little bit about the Public Health Law Center. We're located in St. Paul, Minnesota at the Mitch and Hamlin School of Law, which is itself located on the lands of the Dakota people. We're a dedicated team of attorneys, policy analysts, and support staff who work nationwide on public health policies in the areas of commercial tobacco control, healthy eating, active living, and climate justice. PHLC provides free legal technical assistance across the United States. Our legal TA includes research, publications, in-person trainings, and webinars like this one. We assist communities with policy development, such as our model K-12 school policy, model smoke-free housing policies, and model commercial tobacco retail licensing laws. We can review local policies and provide sample language to achieve public health best practices, but um, we do have some limits on our work. We do not provide direct legal representation and we don't lobby. If you would like legal technical assistance for an area of commercial tobacco policy that you're working on, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. At PHLC, we focus on equity more than equality. Uh, equity is about giving people what they need, which includes understanding barriers, circumstances, and conditions. In an equitable society, something like your race or your gender or sexuality should not be predictive of your health or happiness, and that's what, that's what we're working towards. And when we talk about public health here at PHLC, we try to take a broad view. We're talking about the social determinants of health, the network of policies and factors from housing to education to the criminal justice system that impact people's health and happiness. You know, the public health community does amazing work to pass policies that address those social determinants of health and that try to create a more equitable and healthier world. Uh, and that includes policies that address commercial tobacco. I'm just going to pause here for a second and note that when I use the term commercial tobacco, I do not mean the use of traditional sacred tobacco as part of indigenous practice or lawfully recognized religious, spiritual or cultural ceremony or practice. Um, but when we think about public health policy, you know, we usually think about forming coalitions, engaging stakeholders, drafting laws, and discussing enforcement of existing laws. But what can often be overlooked is how lawsuits over those laws can disrupt our efforts. So this webinar is going to focus on how litigation can derail public health policy, why lawsuits themselves are often worth avoiding, even if you win, uh, and what you can do to help reduce or manage your litigation risk. This is not supposed to be a condensed law school education. I'm, I'm going to assume that folks have an average awareness of the legal system, that you, know, you read the news and you watch the typical amount of courtroom legal dramas, um, but otherwise that you don't have any special legal knowledge. Um, and I'm also uh, not hoping that you come away with this knowing new Latin terms or specific rules of civil procedure, but the real hope is that you just get a better understanding of what we mean at PHLC when we talk about legal risk and what you can do to help better manage that risk. Um, importantly, I'm going to try to walk the line here of emphasizing the costs and risks associated with litigation without making it sound overly daunting. Um, and one thing to remember, I'll come back to this frequently, is that just because big tobacco sues over a law does not mean that they're right. It's worth taking steps to reduce the risk of being sued, but at the end of the day, litigation is a fact of life, and sometimes your public health policies are going to be worth fighting for. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're approaching this issue with our eyes wide open and that we're taking steps to prepare so that we're not caught flat-footed by a lawsuit. Um, and as a kind of final disclaimer here before I begin, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching this with the kind of assumption that we're talking about lawsuits in which the public health community, whether you are working on behalf of a city or a state or an agency, is the defendant in a lawsuit. Um, and I'll just caveat that litigation as, as much as it can be daunting when you are the one sued, can really be a great public health to, tool when you are the plaintiff and you're suing somebody else, in particular, um, big tobacco. So keep that in mind as we go through this. It is a double-edged sword. Oftentimes, the public health community can use litigation to great effect in, in advancing public health, but that risk can rebound on us when we are the defendants. 
So with that, let's let's jump into it with a kind of very basic and fundamental idea, which is that litigation can derail legislation. Now, when we think about public policy in America, you know, you might think back to um, the the how a bill becomes a law, um, Schoolhouse Rock video, right? Um, it starts in the legislative branch and then it goes through the executive branch and then that's it. And, you know, when we think about the legislative branch, um, we're talking about anything all the way up from the U.S. Congress down to local city councils and everything in between. These are folks who are elected um, often to engage in the policy drafting process um, and to write and then deliver bills to the executive branch for their enforcement. And when we talk about the executive branch, then it's the same sort of thing. We're talking about anybody from the president of the United States all the way down to local mayors and local health departments with everything in between. And, and these are people or entities who are responsible for enforcing the law. Um, and in doing so, they often have the opportunity to shape how policy works. You know, so an obvious example would be federal agencies that can promulgate rules which determine the nuts and bolts of how a statute works in practice. But what's often overlooked in the policymaking process is the role that the courts play. And the main power that the courts have with regards to public policy in America is that people can challenge how laws are enforced through lawsuits, which basically gives the courts the ability to go in after the fact and then weigh in on those laws. So going back to kind of American Civics 101, the legislature drafts and passes the law, the executive branch enforces the law, but the courts get to interpret the law. And in some situations, they basically get to say how and when the law is enforced. What are the tools that courts have to do this? They can issue a couple different types of remedies or relief to litigants, um, which can impact the public policy process. Um, the first and probably most relevant one is the idea of forcing a party to do or not to do a certain thing. And they can do that through a couple of different means. Um, I'll just cover a couple here. One is the idea of declaratory reef, relief, and the other is injunctions. Declaratory relief is basically just what it sounds like. The court would declare somebody's rights relative to somebody else's or declare whether a law is valid as enforced in a particular way against particular people. Injunctive, injunctive relief is basically the court instructing a party to do something or to stop doing something, like to stop enforcing a law. And really get a great example of both of these forms of relief is a case recently filed by R.J. Reynolds against um, the state of California titled R.J. Reynolds v. Bonta. And in that case, R.J. Reynolds is challenging the application of SB 793 against so-called non-menthol sensation products. Um, the requested relief in this case is to prevent the California Attorney General's Office from enforcing SB 793 against those products and actually have the AG's office retract some letters that they sent regarding them. Um, so, you know, we had the people of California come out and vote in favor of this flavor policy and the executive branch through the attorney general's office try to enforce it. But there is a potential through this litigation that that enforcement will be limited or at least um, prevented as against these, these so-called sensation products. Another type of damage, or I'm sorry, relief that the courts can offer are money damages. Uh, these are more common when an individual sues the tobacco companies over product defects, but technically a party like tobacco manufacturers or tobacco retailers, um, if they're harmed by a law, they can ask for money to compensate them for that harm. And that, that kind of risk of having to pay out damages um, can often stop jurisdictions from enforcing laws. So the basic idea here is that cities, counties, tribes, and states can pass policies, but courts are going to have a say as well. And that's something we're thinking about when you're drafting those policies to begin with to make sure that courts don't come in after the fact and derail them. So we know that courts can step in and invalidate portions of policies after the fact, but just as important is how they do that. Litigation can be expensive and unpredictable and something that you might want to avoid in its own right, regardless of whether you win or lose. So to give you a sense of why that's the case, I'm going to kind of talk about the life of a case um, as it begins in the district of trial court and goes all the way up to the Supreme Court to really emphasize how time consuming and expensive litigation can be. So we'll start at a very high level here. 
Um, the typical life of a case begins in the trial court or district court in California that's called the superior court. And that's where the parties are going to build their case. They'll collect their facts, they'll identify their witnesses, um, they'll refine their legal arguments and present them to a judge or jury and have them weigh in. Um, after that, in most states, and California is one of them, the losing party will have a right to an appeal at an intermediary court of appeals. And that's basically where the parties get to say that, you know, the district court made a mistake of law, and please won't you correct it. Um, if you lose at the Court of Appeals, you can petition the state Supreme Court to hear your case, but you don't have a right to be heard at the Supreme Court. The California Supreme Court has a discretionary docket, which means they can accept or reject these petitions as they see fit. And typically, they're only going to listen to the cases that have the most salient legal or policy questions. Now, just to complicate things a little bit, in America, we have two court systems that work in parallel to each other. So most cases are heard in state courts, but there's also the federal judiciary that operates in all 50 states, too. Federal courts typically handle cases that pose federal questions, so a question over a federal statute or the federal constitution. And they can also handle cases with what's called diversity of citizenship, when the litigants are coming from different states. Now, there are strategic reasons as to why you might want to litigate in either state or federal court, but for today's purposes, it's sufficient to know that they just, they both work in parallel to each other, um, they both operate very similarly, um, and that a question is usually going to be resolved by one or the other, but not typically both at the same time. To add just kind of one further a caveat or wrinkle to this, um, I'll throw in there that if your case begins in state court, you can litigate your way all the way up through the state Supreme Court. And if there's a federal question involved in your case, say you're suing over the federal U.S. Constitution, you can then jump to the U.S. Supreme Court and petition them to hear your appeal as well. Um, but like the California Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court has a discretionary docket. Um, they only hear between 60 and 70 cases a year, and so typically they, they reject those petitions. All right, let's, let's start at the Superior Court here, because that's where the case begins. That's where it really develops and evolves. Um, I've created a very simplified a kind of timeline of what the life of a case looks like in the Superior Court. And we're going to talk about each of these key events or stages in turn, again, to just give you an emphasis of what litigation looks like on the ground um, and, to, and to know what you might be getting into uh, if you happen to find yourself on the other end of a lawsuit. So we'll begin with the complaint. Um, this is a document filed by the plaintiff, the party who's suing and asking the court for some form of relief in which the plaintiff basically outlines their complaints, um, i.e. who is supposed to have done what and why that's a problem and what they want the court to do about it. It can be a very simple document, um, and it's just supposed to put the defendant on notice of the legal claims at issue and the basic facts that support them. Uh, so for a very simple example, let's say I were to slip and fall in front of a store. Now, I could sue the store owner for the dangerous conditions of their sidewalk. Um, and if I did that, the first thing I would do is I would draft a complaint describing the basic facts about my fall and explaining my legal claims. Maybe I would claim that the store owner was reckless or negligent because of the conditions of their sidewalk. And then I would serve that both on the court and the store owner so that the store owner knew that they were being sued and they would have an understanding of what that lawsuit was going to be about. Now, the next stage is that the defendant either needs to answer the complaint, basically say whether they agree or dispute various allegations made within it, or file what's called a motion to dismiss, in California often called a demurrer, which is kind of an old-fashioned legal term, but that's they're still using it, so that's what we'll go with. Um, that's basically a motion that asks the court to dismiss either the entire case or just elements of the case, because according to the defendant, there's something fatally flawed about the plaintiff's theories or the facts that they've identified in their complaint, and it's saying that it would be a waste of time to proceed any further in litigating. Um, now, importantly, a motion to dismiss or a demur is supposed to be based on purely legal arguments. You have to assume that the facts in the complaint are are true and cannot introduce any new facts. So in my slip and fall case, to continue the example, the store owner might move to dismiss because even if taking all the facts in my complaint is true, there might not be a viable claim. 
Um, that could be because, for example, there's a defect in the facts as I pled them. Maybe I included in the complaint that actually I tripped on my shoelaces. So even according to my own complaint, it wasn't the store owner's fault. Um, more often, though, it's going to be because of some legal defect. Maybe, for example, there's a state law that protects store owners from these sorts of lawsuits. Typically, most cases are going to survive a motion to dismiss, and that's by design. You don't want judges throwing cases out before they even begin. You want to give the plaintiff a chance to develop the facts and ultimately present them to a jury. Um, but in the world of public health litigation, it, it would not be very uncommon for a case to be decided on a motion to dismiss. And that's because the facts are usually clear and the issues are typically purely legal. Um, so does a state law preempt a city from passing a smoke-free ordinance? Does the First Amendment protect a retailer's right to advertise in a certain way? Those are claims that can often be resolved early on and sometimes are. If you get past that, that first motion to dismiss phase, you then move into what's called discovery. Um, and this is really the meat of litigation. And it's where the most time and money is spent. So we're going to focus on this in a little bit more depth. Discovery is the, uh, the part of the case where both parties get to collect information from each other, either to support their claims or to defend against them. Now, normally, you think of your notes and your emails as being private, and typically they are, but very often in litigation, they are discoverable, um, which means that the other side can ask to see them, and you'll have to produce them unless they're attorney-client privileged, and, and we'll come back to that at the end. Um, so basically, any document or communication or information that you have that is going to be relevant to the claims in the case is discoverable and, if requested, should be produced to the other side. That includes electronic information like emails and texts. It includes physical documents. It includes your own memories and recollections and basically everything under the sun. Um, discovery is very broad by design, and that's because in the American court system, you're not supposed to be able to escape legal liability by hiding incriminating documents. Now, that doesn't mean the other side can get everything. Um, there are some ways of limiting discovering to requests, and typically that's by arguing that producing the requested information is just too burdensome or expensive relative to the value of the information, or persuading the court that the requests are just wholly irrelevant to the case. Um, there's a couple different types of discovery requests that are worth knowing about, um, and those include written discovery requests. So some of those might be um, what are called requests for admissions. So in my slip and fall case, I might send a request for an admission to the store owner asking them to admit that they own and control the sidewalk in front of their store, admit that they kept the condition of the sidewalk in disrepair. Um, there are also interrogatories, and those would be written questions that are more general. So you might ask the store owner, um, how many people have slipped in front of your sidewalk? What do you do to keep that sidewalk safe to pedestrians and things of that nature? There are also requests for documents, um, both electronic and physical. Uh, and those, again, can include everything from emails to draft reports um, to personal notes. And if, if a party makes a request for documents, you're going to have to go through your inbox and through your saved folders and through your filing cabinet to make sure that you are finding all of the responsive documents and then sending them over to the other side. And then there's depositions. Um, a deposition is basically like a cross-examination in which a lawyer will ask questions of a particular identified witness, except it doesn't happen at trial and in a courtroom. It happens before trial and typically, you know, in a conference room. Um, so, you know, think about your typical kind of TV cross-exam in a courtroom, except imagine it in a Marriott hotel um, and have lasting eight hours with, with an attorney. And then everything that you say in that deposition is likely and, and possibly going to be used in the court case as evidence. So what's, what's the upshot of all this? Why do we focus on it? It's to emphasize that discovery is expensive. The labor cost of finding and producing relevant documents alone can be immense. And it's also very time consuming. It can last months and people up and down your organization might be involved as witnesses or they might have to be interviewed to determine if they have relevant documents. And it can be embarrassing. Um, the things you said in an email to a coworker or the things you said in a deposition to a lawyer um, will become available to the other side and they can even be made public in legal briefs. 
you know, courtroom dramas, they usually gloss over discovery disputes or, or they do it through a kind of montage sequence. But this is what makes and breaks most cases. And it's worth thinking about in the event that you get caught up in a really fact intensive case with a lot of discovery. All right, now usually as discovery comes to a close, one or both parties will move for summary judgment. Summary judgment is similar to a motion to dismiss in that the party will be asking for a judgment in their favor before the actual trial on the basis that the evidence is so one-sided that there's really no reason to proceed further. Um, the main difference between summary judgment and a motion to dismiss is that at the motion to dismiss phase, you're really raising what amounts to just purely legal arguments and any facts you include have to come from the complaint itself. But at the summary judgment phase, you can introduce all of the facts that you've been collecting through the discovery phase. So in my slip and fall case, for example, I might move for summary judgment and say that there's no purpose to proceeding to trial because the evidence is overwhelmingly in my favor and no reasonable jury could rule for the defendant. Maybe I have multiple eyewitnesses supporting me and some emails from the store owner in which they acknowledge the dangerous conditions of their storefront sidewalk. Um, just to be clear, though, there is still a high threshold to win on summary judgment, because like at the motion to dismiss phase, we don't like the idea that a judge is making these decisions instead of a jury. The final stage of trial, if you get through all of the proceeding, is trial, of course. Um, I'm not going to focus on this too much because you probably have a, a decent idea of what those might look like from movies and TV shows, but I am just going to touch on a couple of things. Um, first, you know, you have a right to a jury trial, but you can waive that right and have a judge trial instead. Um, there's various strategic reasons for waiving the right to a jury trial that we don't really need to go into, but I just mention it because it's a common misconception that you always, you know, anticipate there being a jury in the room um, at the trial phase, but, but sometimes it's just the judge. Um, and I will also note that even if the, if the trial lasts just a few days, um, it can still be very expensive to prepare for. When you prepare for trial, you have to collect all the exhibits, you have to line up your witnesses, you have to prepare them, you have to draft opening and closing statements and game plan and practice everything. And so it can take a week or more to prepare for just a one day trial. Um, and so then the last thing I'll say about trial is that, you know, you're probably not likely to get to the trial phase in those cases in which the industry or a retailer is challenging a public health law or ordinance. Um, and that's because as I mentioned before, those, those issues really are mostly legal in nature. And so they're probably gonna be resolved at the motion to dismiss or summary judgment phase, um, or more likely the parties will settle. And, and we're gonna come back to that later and talk about what a settlement means. All right, so let's say, let's say you get through the trial and there's a verdict, what happens next? Well, now you move to the appellate phase. Um, the first step, as we discussed, is the Court of Appeals. And here, as in the State Supreme Court, the issues should be limited to just legal questions. Was there a legal error made at the district court? The, the Court of Appeals is not supposed to reweigh the facts and second guess the jury or the fact finder. Um, but just because the appellate phase of litigation is limited to legal questions and is in some ways more streamlined because of that does not mean that it happens um, to go very quickly or that it happens to be cheap. Uh, the median time from when a notice of an appeal is filed to when a written opinion is released in the state of California is about 19 months. And that's because when you file an appeal, you know, the first thing you have to do is draft briefs explaining to the Court of Appeals what went wrong below. And then you have to prepare for oral argument if they're going to hold it. And then the judges have to make up their minds and then they have to draft an opinion and agree with each other over what that opinion says. And that takes time. And it also takes money to do all of that work. Um, if you lose at the Court of Appeals, as I mentioned, you can petition to the state Supreme Court. Um, but again, that's a discretionary appeal. And so there's no guarantee that the state Supreme Court will weigh in on it. Um, but if they do, then that's that's more or less the end of the road, unless, again, you're going to try for the U.S. Supreme Court. So everything that we just talked about is to give you a sense of what litigation looks like and how it works. And that's by way of emphasizing that litigation is expensive both in terms of dollars and time. Civil suits can easily take two to four years to be fully resolved. And so even if you end up winning at the end of that four year period, most people wish that they didn't have to go through that to begin with. But litigation is also unpredictable. 
you know, your attorneys can give you a decent sense of what to expect, but, you know, whether you have a good case or if it's going to be an uphill battle to win, but it's hard to know for certain what's going to happen. And one of the ways of explaining why litigation can be unpredictable and how we know it's unpredictable is to talk about settlements. Um, now, I, I'm just going to say at the outset, a, a settlement is basically a contract in case you're not familiar with them. It's an agreement by which one side agrees to dismiss the case in exchange for something, usually money or an agreement that the defendant will stop doing something. And most cases do eventually settle. And that's because at some point, both sides are going to get an idea of what's probably going to happen. And then they're going to decide it's not worth proceeding. So they come up with an agreement to dismiss the case and the terms of that agreement. Um, and you can settle the case at any time. You can settle right after the complaint is filed or right before the Supreme Court issues its opinion. Um, it, you know, it just depends on when people finally have that, that moment where they realize this is not worth uh, proceeding. So in my slip and fall case, for example, it might become clear at some point at the Superior Court or at the Court of Appeals or wherever that I'm going to win. And that's, that's it. That's that both sides realize that. Um, and so I might agree to dismiss my case against the store owner if they promise to pay me money and maybe promise to take better care of the sidewalk in front of their store. Um, so most cases settle, but some don't. And that's because at the end of the day, it's impossible to know for certain what's going to happen and how you should value a case. And the two sides might reasonably disagree on those outcomes. And so let's, let's dive into that a little bit deeper and break it down. Um, in a settlement negotiation, both sides are going to want to come up with an offer or a range of offers that they're going to be comfortable with. And that's going to be based on a combination of their perception of how likely they are to win or lose and how good or bad the various outcomes might be. So in a very simplified version, in my slip and fall case, let's say that um, I've talked it over with my attorney and our best guess is I've got a 50% chance of winning. And that's based on our assessment of the law and the facts. And that if I win, I'm likely to win about a million dollars from the jury. So if I'm being a rational actor, anything at or above 500,000 would probably be good enough to get me to settle. Maybe I want to gamble and go to trial and go for that one million, but there's also you know, that coin flip chance that I end up with zero. So if the defendant offers me six or $700,000, I'd probably be very happy with that and I would choose to settle the case. But whether to settle or not is still a judgment call. You know, this mathematical formula here might be deceptively simple because the, the variables that go into it are really kind of a, a more a question of art than math. So when we talk about your chance of success, you're talking about the strength of your legal argument. And in the law, there's a lot of gray areas. You're talking about your assessment of the facts and the evidence. And that's you know, going to be dependent upon how credible your witnesses are going to look, for example, to a jury or a judge. And you're talking about the disposition and tendencies of the judges and juries. Even valuing the case itself can be difficult to do objectively. There's going to be different guesses as to what the money damages might be and values that you attach to intangible things, like the value of being able to enforce a really good public health ordinance. And there might be strategic value beyond a case. Um, that's especially important for big tobacco because oftentimes they sue not because they're really concerned about what happens to a particular ordinance in a particular city, but because they want to set a legal precedent that that ordinance is unconstitutional. And so there might be no value that they would be willing to settle for because the value of setting that precedent is so great to them. So most cases settle but some of them don't. And that's because at the end of the day, litigation is inherently unpredictable and reasonable people can disagree over the likely outcomes and the value of those outcomes. All right, so we've covered a lot of grounds. So we're getting toward the end here. So let's do kind of the mid-course summary. So we know that litigation is expensive and time consuming. We know that when you lose, that can have a real impact on public policy because it might mean the court invalidates a public health ordinance or law. And we know that bad precedent set by the courts can have cascading effects because it might bind other courts and other jurisdictions. And we know that outcomes are hard to predict. Even if you're pretty sure that your law is constitutional, you can never know for certain. And most importantly, the industry knows all of this. And so they will oftentimes threaten litigation in order to get their way because they know that people are gonna be worried about all those things we've just talked about and maybe think that it's not worth pursuing 
um, just because of that threat. And that's what I mean by legislating in the shadow of litigation. Sometimes that looming threat of litigation can impact your policymaking choices without a lawsuit ever being filed. So how do we address this and minimize the risk? Here's a couple of ideas. First of all, find out who your attorney is and work with them. Hopefully all of you are attached to somebody, whether it's the attorney general's office or tribal council or some other in-house counsel who can walk you through the potential litigation threats to your policies. So find out who those people are and form a relationship now and run by your policy ideas with them early and often so that there's a chance for them to give you guidance and for you to implement that guidance. Secondly, assess your risk tolerance. Remember, just because big tobacco sues over a policy does not mean they're right. You have to weigh the public health benefit of your policy against the risk of losing and the cost of litigation. Many times it's gonna be worth it to go to court, but that's something that only you along with your attorney can answer. And it's also something that's worth thinking about in advance. So again, you know how to respond if and when you get a complaint in the mail. You also want to factor legal risk into all of your decisions and the policymaking process. There's a couple of claims that tend to come up quite frequently in the commercial tobacco space. And I will note the Public Health Law Center is here to help you with this. We have primers and resources on just about every sort of problem that you might run into if you want to further educate yourself on these matters. But also you want to work with your attorneys to understand the really specific issues with policies that you're considering so that you can address them before it becomes an actual issue. So here I have just a brief list, um, things like preemption the idea that a state or federal law might preempt and prevent a local jurisdiction from passing, say, a smoke-free ordinance. Um, there could be commercial free speech implications, especially to ordinances or laws that um, impact advertising. Uh, there could be regulatory takings clause issues. So some policies, especially if they approach something like an end game policy, um, the, the retailer or tobacco manufacturer might are so severe it amounts to a takings and you have to compensate retailers because you're, you're basically taking their property from them. Or there could be procedural problems. Maybe they, the retailer or the manufacturer has a problem with how you went about passing a law or they don't think there was sufficient evidence in the record to justify it. Um, in any event, you want to kind of explore those and other claims um, as you go along to help address and mitigate them so that if your policy isn't litigation proof, at least the risk of litigation goes down. And then finally, this is kind of a technical way to end, but I, I do think it's important. I want to return to the idea of attorney-client privilege. Um, now, we talked about in discovery how basically everything that's relevant to a claim is discoverable except for privileged communications. And what I mean by that are communications written or oral between you and your attorney that are held in confidence and in which there you are seeking legal advice or the attorney is giving legal advice. And if those elements are met, that communication is attorney-client privileged and is protected from discovery and the other side can't get access to it. But I wanna emphasize here, this only protects communications between you and your attorney. It doesn't protect communications between you and your coworker or between you and your neighbor um, or between you and another lawyer who's not actually representing you. And it only protects communications that are confidential. So if you forward an email that your lawyer sent to you in which they give you legal advice to somebody outside of your organization, you might have destroyed that confidentiality and that email then might become confidential or discoverable. Um, or if you talk about legal advice you give, um, again, that might destroy that confidence and make that communication discoverable in litigation. All right, so we covered a lot of ground here, maybe a semester's worth of law school content. Um, hopefully you found that useful. Just as, as a summary at the end, um, and what I hope you've taken away from this is the idea that when we think about the policymaking process, you want to do everything that you've been doing, but remember that the courts are going to have a say as well, and they can derail even the best public health policies. Um, and even if you win after litigating, litigation itself is so expensive and unpredictable, oftentimes it's worth avoiding. Um, industry is going to use this as a threat to prevent good health, public health policy from getting out the door to begin with. And that's why we want to work hard to manage legal risk on the front end, because public health is worth that fight, and PHLC is here to help you in that fight. So again, appreciate your time. Um, hope you found that informative. And um, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm, I'm open and available to, for the duration.